It was something that took place every day, at any time, morning, evening, round the clock. And I didn't see my family from when I was four until 11. I was a prisoner in that school. Woodford School for the Deaf closed more than 20 years ago. This is the original site. It was the scene of terrible sexual abuse spanning three decades. As adults, 28 of the children abused here were later ready to testify in court against their abuser. But the court case collapsed. For the first time, we hear their story and reveal the identity of their abuser. In 1951, teacher Beatrice Ingall and her husband Eric set up a private nursery for young deaf children in Woodford, East London. Mrs. Ingle taught the pupils while her husband was the bursar, driver and handyman. The Ingalls lived in the house that the young boarders slept in. By the late 1950s, Eric Ingle, then in his 30s, had begun to assault some of the children in their beds. I was disgusted and I was afraid. He said thank you and walked off. I was afraid and I didn't sleep well after that. He then came again twice a week for a few months. Well, there seems to be a belief among autologists and authorities... Mrs Ingle, shown here in a 1974 documentary about the school, was actually aware of the abuse, according to Miriam and other former pupils we've spoken to. Mr Ingle's wife came and she saw and she completely wasn't bothered and left me there with him and went back to her bedroom. The age of children who were abused ranged from three to 11. Many were too young to even understand what was happening. I didn't know anything. I thought it was supposed to be fun and that it was acceptable. I just went along with it. I didn't realize. David only realized much later that what had happened was criminal. I trained to become a youth worker. I wanted to work with young people. I went on a training course where we learned about different types of abuse. When we were taught about sexual abuse, I took that on board. And that's when looking back, I realized that was what had happened to me. What do you think is in the bag? I'm there's no suggestion that anybody shown in the 1974 documentary was involved in the abuse. Woodford used speech and lip reading to teach the children. A toy. At the time, sign language was not widely taught in schools. The fact that the pupils sometimes struggled to communicate made it easier for Ingall's behaviour to pass unnoticed. There was a busy road with a playground and there'd be people walking past. But we had no communication because we couldn't speak, we couldn't sign, and they couldn't understand our voices, so we'd try and write notes. But our vocabulary was limited. The only word we knew was rude. We'd make paper aeroplanes and throw them. People would pick them up, read them and laugh and wave and go on their way. And we would feel frustrated. At the end of the summer holiday in 1964, 
James's mother became suspicious about his reluctance to return to Woodford School. He eventually told her what had been happening. I just talked about it to her, and then she said, right, you're not going back to that school. You finished at that school. We never talked about it again, never. James was immediately removed from the school by his mother. After making inquiries, she discovered something shocking. Earlier that year, Ingle had pleaded guilty to indecently assaulting two of the school's pupils. He had asked for seven other offences to be taken into consideration. The detective working on the case said Ingle was a man of previous good character, and a former mayor of Woodford had testified in his favour, suggesting that overwork might have caused the lapse. Stratford Court fined Ingle £50 and placed him on probation for two years, with the condition that he should absent himself from the school buildings while children were there. A Freedom of Information request has revealed that the Department for Education also disqualified Ingle from being a proprietor of the school. James's mother wrote to the school to complain and referred to the newspaper article. Mrs Ingle replied, I am puzzled by your wish to have a copy of a local newspaper. Why not write to me and ask for details? Why be so devious? That's right, good boy. Ingle continued his abuse throughout the probation period and into the next decade. Another complaint was lodged with the school in 1970. Mrs Ingle informed parents that the police decided not to proceed further. She also criticised deliberate and malicious rumour mongering and warned, before the inevitable bricks begin to fly, may I remind you that nothing now can hurt Mr Ingle anymore Bricks can now only rebound against your child. Mrs Ingle finally retired as headmistress in 1984. By this time, local authorities were moving away from the use of specialist schools to educate deaf children in favour of mainstream schooling. Pupil numbers at the school fell sharply and it eventually closed down in 1991. For Sandra, things were also coming to a head as the effects of her abuse contributed to a breakdown. Sandra's allegations in 1992 were investigated by police, but no action was taken as Ingle, then in his late 60s, was thought to be senile. Another seven years passed before a fresh effort was made to bring him to justice. A group of us rallied together and wanted to bring it up again. We had access to interpreters, therefore there was better communication. Anne was a child abuse investigator for the Met. She worked on the case for almost five years, including considerable time spent trying to persuade the court that Ingle was fit to stand trial. The case eventually came before a judge in March 2004. On the second day of the hearing, Judge Burr announced that the trial could not proceed. Firstly, he said the length of time that had passed meant there was a paucity of material and lack of available witnesses, many of whom have subsequently died. Secondly, the judge said, I do not wish to criticise the complainants in any way at all, but it cannot be right for people to allow another 15 or 20 years to go by before drawing the attention of the competent authorities to instances of historical abuse. He also cited Ingle's age. I was very happy. I was very happy. I felt angry, so angry. I couldn't believe it. I was lost. I was so angry, so frustrated. It demonstrates a complete lack of uh, empathy and understanding in terms of this, of child sexual abuse. 
because he didn't give uh, the survivors their opportunity to tell their story and had he done, he would have heard uh, why it's so difficult for a victim to be able to tell, uh, what's hap to, to tell someone what's happened to them. So, yeah, it was very, very unhelpful and naive. The judge in Ingle's trial also referred to the 1992 investigation. It may be that the situation on an application similar to this one 12 years ago would have met with a different response. Mr Ingle was only 68 at the time, which is very different from being 80. After the 2004 trial was halted, the witnesses abandoned their attempt to bring Ingle to justice. In 2012, Eric Ingle died. It would be easy to dismiss what happened at Woodford as the product of another era, but concerns around the protection of deaf children remain today. They are three times more vulnerable to being abused than hearing children. Even with lots of residential deaf schools closing down, the sexual abuse and other types of abuse are continuing. Efforts to improve the protection of deaf children from abuse will continue, but it's little comfort to those who failed to get justice. Our lives are really spoilt, myself and others as well. Now I'll tell you, in all my life I've never had a boyfriend. I'm not married, I hate men. Throughout my life, because of him.